Good morning. How is everybody today? Awesome. Well, we just want to welcome you to Holly Springs. My name is Kyle Ivey. I'm a deacon here at this wonderful church, and we're so glad that you're uh, here with us today. Uh, happy Father's Day, by the way, to all the dads out there. Um, we are excited to have all of you guys here with us. Uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to pray for us, and uh, we're going to stand up and welcome each other, and then we'll get into some music. So let me pray for us. Father God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for your many blessings, Father God. And Lord, I just thank you for all the dads that are here. Lord, I just lift them up to you. I just pray that these wives can spoil them today. And Father God, I just thank you for the, uh, the, the role that they have in bringing up children. I just thank you for the role that they bring in uh, leading a godly home, Father. Lord, just be with them, guide them, direct them. Lord, I just pray for our, our mission trips with our youth and our, our people in Ecuador. Father, God, I just pray that uh, your will will be done down there, Father. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we uh, worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all stand up and worship. I got cut up. Let's come together and worship this morning. Let's sing Amazing Love. Amazing love that sent His Son to suffer in my stead. The sinless King who died for Jesus, glorious risen one, 
No grave could keep him safe. And he who triumphed over death now lives and leads my way. He lives and leads my way. He lives. He lives. God of Jacob. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of
Let's sing Jesus one more time. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Father, thank you uh, that you expel the darkness. Uh, God, the fact that we can cling to you as a source of safety and security uh, because, God, you, as we see from Psalm 23, God, you walk through the shadows of the darkest valley. God, your rod and your staff, they comfort us. So whatever storms or trials or challenges that we may be going through, God, we can cling to you as our shepherd who keeps us safe. And we know that, God, you are um, our salvation. And so we rejoice in that this morning, and we praise you for that. And we pray all of this in your name. Amen. You may take a seat. We are going to continue this morning with a scripture reading. So if you have a copy of scripture, we invite you to turn to Psalm chapter 19. We're going to read verses 7 through 14. We invite you to read this together with your families or your friends or a stranger, or by yourself, and really uh, read these words and uh, give attention to them, uh, read them carefully, uh, and then we will come back together at the end of this and we will pray. Verse 9 says, The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. They are a warning to your servant, a great reward for those who obey them. And back in verse 8, it says, The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. As we walk through life, there's a lot of decisions that we can make. Um, there's a lot of, of areas of our life that, that feel chaotic and sporadic, um, but the truth of the matter is that if our solid foundation is God and his word, then we our paths are sure and steady in the future because his word, uh, it brings joy to the heart. His word, his words are pure and they are reliable because um, like I just said, God is a shepherd and he guides us well and a way that he guides us is through his word. 
And so um, if any of us are uh, feeling lost or confused or looking for next steps, his word is the best place that we can start. With his word as a solid foundation, uh, he will guide us where he wants us to be. And we can be sure of that. We can have confidence in that. So let me pray that it would be so. Father, thank you for your words and for how good and how pure and perfect that they are. God, we can trust that no matter our circumstances, if we turn to your words, that you will give us guidance. Uh, Because, God, you desire for us to walk in the way that you um, hope for us to go. And so we know that from your words, you guide us in that direction. So, Father, for those of us this morning uh, that may feel lost or confused or or in need of direction, God, would you give us that direction? Would you help us all to build you and your word as a solid foundation um, in our lives? God, would you build on that solid foundation as we continue to grow in relationship with you? Father, we love you and we thank you and we pray all of this in your mighty name. Amen. Kids, don't leave yet. Last time we had Mother's Day, we, we left too fast. If I can, can I have all the dads stand up for us? To be called a dad is sometimes, um, I don't know, sometimes it's an honor, sometimes it feels like a duty, but I will say this, it's an absolute blessing to be a dad. For some of us in this room, um, for some of us in this room, what we have is uh, we have a, a gift. Our kids are going to come around and they're going to hand a gift to you. And what I would like is we're going to pray over our dads in just a minute. And, um, but there are two people I just want to talk about. Some of us today, it's not that our dad is here with us, but maybe we miss our dad. But your dad's legacy and your dad's life has really still lived through you. And for some of us, when it comes down to it, our dad is the reason why we are who we are today. Um, even if it's good or bad. But when it comes down to it, we can't live, I mean, I don't, I don't know what to do without a dad. And for some of you, even in this room, you have even been a father figure to, even to me. So I'd say thank you so much for just being a good dad, um, being a good father. All right, I think they're done. Let me pray over our dads. If you have a, uh, if you're, your dad's there, put your hand on your dad. Love on your dad. Let's pray over your dad before we even start. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much. God, I thank you so much for dads. I thank you so much for fathers. That God, you are the perfect heavenly father. And God, I pray, Lord, that we can be like you. God, I am so grateful for the blessings that you've let us be dads. God, that you've given us kids, that you've given us amazing wives, that you've given us amazing lives. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we live those lives for you. God, I pray, Lord, that every dad here would know you. And God, I pray, Lord, that their family would be built around the word, just like Austin just spoke. And God, I pray, God, that, um, and God, we thank you for our dads. We thank you for those, maybe even the dads that have gone, who've passed on. And for some of us, this is a hard day because we think about our dad. But Lord, I pray, Lord, that we can be able to trust and believe in you. Lord, we thank you for our dads. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. I'm not going to do well with that. I? I will fidget with it. So, If you have your Bibles, would you please turn to Matthew chapter 7. I think this is the last time I have to tell you to turn to chapter 7. I think it was Kyle who says that moms or wives go home and school your husbands. Um, just let them take a nap. That's all they need. They just need a nap. That's all they really would want. Um, my wife asked me, she said, she goes, what do you want for this day? And... Um, from you? I said, not really nothing. I said, but, from, I, but your mom can make me chicken and rice gumbo. I said, that would be really good. And I think that's what I have coming for me today. So I'm excited about that. Um, we were, today we are going to be able to wrap up our sermon series in a way, because I can't quit with this Matthew thing. Um, we're going to wrap up our sermon series with the Sermon on the Mount. We are right here at the end with the last metaphor in verses 24 through, we're going to go all the way to the end, through 29. 
Um, if you're new with us for 19 weeks, we have walked through every single verse, every single piece of the last chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew. And I say this to you for those who have been here and who haven't been here. If you have been here, we've walked through every single piece of Jesus' most essential teachings. And if you've been here through any of these teachings, you know without a doubt that they are hard to hear. That Jesus' teachings are something that is not an easy thing to listen to. Because what he does is he calls us out. He calls us out for who we are. He knows the heart of man. He knows what we're like. He knows how we live. And he calls us out on the things that we do. And so what, when it comes down to living this way, I say this to you all. The last two or three weeks have probably been the hardest. Because what Jesus does is at the very end of this sermon, he kind of leaves it very climactic that he hits this climax. And this is, we're actually coming down from the climax. Last week, I have had multiple people say, man, man, that, those are hard words. Last week, we covered the sermon, we covered the sermon for those who says that, say, Lord, Lord to me, those who have done amazing things in my name, for those who have maybe gone to church or helped volunteer at Vacation Bible School, those who've done all these great things, that those people, when they see Jesus, he might say, I never knew them. Because the idea is, is that you know him because you obey him. If you don't know him, you don't obey him. The week before that, the sermon, when you look at the, go back to the verses, it actually talks about the narrow way. It talks about the broad way. That the narrow way is the, is the hard road. And the broad way is the easy road. But it leads to destruction. Today, we will see another metaphor. And this metaphor is so perfect for Father's Day. There's probably nothing more perfect for Father's Day than this next metaphor is the idea, what do you build your house on? Do you build your house on a rock or do you build your house on sand? And for if you're a dad in this room, this is a great question for you. If you're a dad in this room, what is your family built on? What is your life built on? And I say this as gingerly as I can, which is not very. Your kids know. As a youth pastor, one of the hardest things for me to do was for me to sit here and listen to a kid tell me everything about their mom and dad. And they would do is they would meet with me and have lunch with me or they'd speak with me and they would say, hey, let me tell you about my mom and dad. They're not what they appear. They really don't. They look good on the outside. But when it comes down to it, they have no faith in God. They have faith in their money. They have faith in the stuff that they can get them. But they have very little foundation in Christ. And I can't tell you how many times that was true of how many people would say, yeah, I don't want to be like my mom and dad. I don't want to be like them. But then there's those that are so sweet that they're just this opposite way. They're going, I want to be just like my dad. I want to be just like my mom. Because they love the Lord. They love him so much. And so when you hear the idea of the foundation, I want you to really ask yourself, what foundation are you built on? What is your rock? What do you put your hope into? If you're a non-believer in this room and you're a complete atheist and you're saying this whole thing is silly, first off, glad you're here. The second thing is, is the idea of hope is what an atheist will never have. Ever. Their hope is in themselves and stuff and things. And those things will always run you dry. And so let's, let's stand as we read verses 24 through 29. Let's read these scriptures and let's pray over them. It says this, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who has built his house on a rock. And the rain will fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it was founded on a rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man 
who built his house on sand. And when the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house, it fell. And with a great fall, it did. Verse 28. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teachings. For he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as the scribes. Let's, let's pray. God, I pray, Lord, that you speak to us now. God, I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to dads in this room. Lord, I pray, Lord, you'd speak to moms in this room, and you would speak to us as we would understand where are we putting our foundation at? What do we put our hope into? God, it's so easy to put our hope into so many other things, but God, I pray, Lord, that we would understand that to be on the narrow way is to, to live on the harder road. The broad road's easy, and everyone takes it. But those will be the ones that say, when you go to them, they will say, Lord, Lord, did we not do these things in your name? And God, you will say, I do not know you. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we know where our foundation belongs today. And if we don't, today's the day that we start to build it on it. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. If you would, um, this being the last sermon, um, on Saturday... We had eight of our people leave to go to Ecuador with Pastor Bobby, and they are leaving. This morning, early, early this morning, we had over 20-something of our youth and adults dry, are starting a trek eight hours east, eight hours east to Alabama. They're going by Labattery, Alabama, and they are going to do mission work down there. Um, I would never take kids that far away, um, but he did, and uh, that's awesome. He's going to do a great job. Um, we're just praying the vans make it all the way there and make it all the way back. So, hey, I need you to be in prayer for that this week. Um, if you are a deacon in this church in any way, shape, or form, if you're a deacon, I need an impromptu deacon meeting after we- this Wednesday night. I need you to be here. We're going to talk about some growth of our church, uh, maybe even some building plans of maybe be able to... To, to change things and even move things, but I need the deacons, I need you to be able to be here after church on this Wednesday night. And so um, if you are a deacon, please be there. Um, if we look at these next couple weeks, um, church starts getting crazy. We have mission trip, mission trip. We even have kids camp that comes up, all these different things. We need as much prayer as we can because this is when we start having, really people start to really have their lives changed. I have all the time, dads and moms always say, man, I really wish we could have camp for, um, for adults. And, and honestly, you get it almost every Sunday. But we just choose to not look at it that way. We choose not to see it as church that way. This last week, we even had uh, probably about five to ten of our individuals in our church participate in a mission act. And we thank you so much for doing that. It's such, a, such an amazing thing to see our church serve and just have such a heart to help so many people. If you're not serving, you need to get involved because it's an amazing place to be able to, just to, to serve in any different ways. So let's look at this metaphor. Let's look what Jesus is saying here. For, for everyone who hears these words of mine, and I want you to understand that's the way it would start. So he talks about this, this final metaphor as he talks about in the last part of the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, all these words of mine. So when you think about the idea of what he's saying in the words of mine, he's talking about everything that he said from chapters 5, 6, and 7. Now, he says a lot in chapters 5, 6, and 7. So when you sit here and say, if you hear these words of mine, all of these words, not some of these words. But but this this metaphor, I think, has more meaning to Jesus. I think that's the reason why he, he finishes with it. Because Jesus was a carpenter by trade. He He built things. He built tables. He built you know, furniture. He built all these different things out of wood. And he definitely had an idea of how to build a house. And he knew that people who built houses, it would be very important that you make sure you build your house because if there's anything that's more important than a house, it should be its foundation. So if you think about it, this seems like a very easy thing to understand. But, but in the land of Israel, and I want you to understand, um, one thing that is very neat about where our latitude is, now there's Latitude and longitude, okay? So where we are on the map, we're very much in common with with the same type of weather that happens in Israel. Now, what Israel has that we don't have is they have the Mediterranean Sea to its its, uh, west. 
but we don't have that. But what we do have is we have a lot of, you have the specific ocean and things. And so what happens is the weather that they would see in Israel would very much mirror a lot of ours. Now, for you who've been alive and been in East Texas for these last couple months, we can get rain and not a little bit of rain. We can get a lot of rain all at one time. And then what will happen is we will have like two months with crazy rain and then we'll have two to three months with no rain at all. It's the exact same thing that would happen in Israel. So where Israel is, there would be a lot of valleys. There's not, there's not as much flat land, but it's basically a lot of hills and a lot of valleys, very much like this. What, what they don't have is they don't have the tree population that we have. They would have very fertile grounds and very pretty grasses and all these different things, but they would not have as much of a tall trees like we're used to. They, their shrubs may be as, as tall as this room is, um, tallest tree might be just this size. They would not have very large trees. You'd have to go up to Lebanon or up uh, north of that, near Tyre and things like that for you to be able to get into the tall trees, um, the, the, the trees like you hear in the Bible about the cedars that are there in Lebanon. And, and I say all this because these people knew what it was like to live in a storm. So when Jesus uses this analogy, he understands that I'm going to be able to explain to you how important it is that you build your house on a rock because you know the storms that are coming. And you imagine, based on the storms that we've experienced here, we know what it's like to have a tornado. We know what it's like to have wind storms. We know what it's like to have flooding. And why does your house stand? Now, some of our houses, they're built on concrete foundations. Some of them are built and they're peered in. So there's all different types of houses when it comes down to everybody in this room. But the type of foundation is what makes you safe and maybe not. In a tornado, anyone who lives maybe even a, in, a, in, a, in a house that's not attached to the ground, they're in greater risk than someone who has one. And we all know that. Why? We have lived through this. But for all of us in this room, this should be a very good illustration for all of us. If you are in the middle of the storm, where do you want to be? Because if you think about it, the storms in life, it's not if they come, it's when they come. And either we are a wise builder or we are a foolish builder. So if you look there, two houses that could look amazingly the same on the outside. Like, let's just think about it. We have two houses. but One house is beautifully painted. One of them house is beautifully painted. Everything looks good. Maybe state of the art. Maybe they have, you know, keyless entry. You can be able to have all the amazing lights, all the amazing stuff. And from the outside... Each one of these houses looks terrific and pristine. They, they have all the new trends. Um, they may even paint their house black. That's a new thing. I don't understand it. But yeah, they may even paint their house black. I don't know. But they have all these amazing things. They, they, they have all the, the shingles. They maybe have all the right things that everybody would want on a new house. But you can't see their foundation. Because if you think about it, even as you drive by someone's house, you might be able to see their foundation, but you might only get to see maybe just a little bit of it. You don't get to see their foundation. But isn't that how we are as church people? That I can see you right here, right now, but I don't know your foundation. You're good at hiding it. That, that I can't see who you really are, that we have nice clothes, that we have nice cars, we have nice houses, we know all the theology. We might even know everything about the Bible. But our foundation is out of sight. Because we look good on the outside, but on the inside, we're built on sand. So I've got to explain to you what does it mean to be built on sand and what is it not. Because here's the thing. For all of you in this room, you should ask yourself, am I built on sand? So you have to know what your foundation is. People who, are, 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 who, have a, who know what their foundation is are built around the things of God. And I say this again to you, the people who know this the most about your foundation, you can hide it from me and you can hide it from the people in this church, but you can't hide it from your family. They know. They know your foundation. Your kids know what your foundation is. They usually tell me everything. 
But there are only two types of foundations. There are only two types of dads in this room. One of the dads is on a rock, and one of them is on sand. There's only one type of mom. One mom that has a strong foundation with the Lord and those who don't. There's only two types of families here. And so let's look. Look there at verse 24. For everyone then who hears these words of mine does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on a rock. So how do you build a foundation on the rock? And you compare, look at the, look at the two, look at verse 24 and verse 26. Verse 24, it starts off this way. It says, everyone who hears these words of mine. Okay, look at verse 26. And everyone who hears these words of mine. Jesus is pointing, so this is saying, if you've heard these words, if you've heard my teaching, and you do it, you will be on a rock. If you don't do what my teachings, you will not be on a rock. You will be in the sand. So what this is calling us to is obedience. Do we obey the word of God? Dads, do you obey the word of God? Now, here, there, there's two things here. Some of us know the word of God. Some of us can teach the word of God. Some of us know exactly what it says, and we are, we've, been in this, we've been in church way too long in our life, but yet we do not obey it at all. You know, it's a funny thing in my house. Um, it's very easy to say, you know, do as I say, not as I do. Have you ever said, you've said that? I know I've said it. I've said silly, I've done silly things. Don't do what I do, kids, because what I'm doing is wrong, although I want you not to do that. And it might be something silly and stupid, like, you know, pick on your mom or, or throw, throw something across the room or do things like this. Like, I would get in trouble. You could hear my wife saying, you're going to break something, you know. And, and she's going to say, you're being a bad example on these kids. And I'll be honest, she's exactly right. She is absolutely exactly right. But what Jesus is saying in this is, if you obey these words of mine, you'll be putting your house on a rock. If you ignore these words of mine, you're putting your house in sand. And so when we see these things and we see this, what Jesus is saying is, is that there's two houses. There's a house that's built on obedience. Now, I want to go back to what we said last week. Because if we go back to last week and we start talking about this, go back, go back to verse 21. Look at verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But, but look at what it says. But the one who does the will of my Father. Obedience. Obedience is what will say those who will get to heaven. Is in heaven. Verse 22. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Which again, he's basically differentiating the idea of this person who is In the kingdom of heaven, they obey the word of God. Those who do not, they do not obey. Now, this does not mean that you're saved because you obey right. But I will say this, if you are saved, you want to obey. You want to follow the word of God. Look, look, go back to the, go back to the verses before that. Look at verse 15. Oh, I'm sorry. The verse is 13. It says, enter by the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. In other words, The broad road, the easy road, leads to destruction, just like the sand on the foundation. Look there, verse 14. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. The narrow way is hard. Building your house on a rock is hard. Building your house on sand is easy. For dads in this room, for families in this room, this is what I ask. Are you building your house the hard way or the easy way? Because there's something that's very easy in this culture that we live in. Let's just give in to the culture. 
You know, just, just let somebody else raise your kids. Let somebody else do all the work. Let somebody else live, live your life. Don't teach your kids the right basics, truths. Instead, ah, they'll figure it out. Oh, we made, and, and here's what we say. We made the same mistakes when we were their age. Doesn't mean you should still let them do it. You also didn't have a phone in your hand. You, you can't live this. You can't let your kids live the same life you live. You can't because it is a totally different world today. If you do, you will lose them. What they will do is they will change and everything in their brain will be warped because what it is is they don't understand where the foundation is. They don't have a clue about the narrow way. You know why? Because it's so easy to go the broad way. Well, didn't we go to church? Didn't we walk an aisle? Didn't I get baptized? And Jesus will say, I never knew you. And the reason why he will say that is because they have to know him by their obedience, by the way they, they love Jesus. If you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 22 says this. It says, But be doers of the word, not hearers only. So, be doers of the word, not hearers only. Obey. Don't be just ones who hear the word, but be the ones that obey the word. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently into his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and it goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and, pers and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but doer who acts, he will be a blessed in his doing. Be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. And as a pastor, I, I say this not with very much frustration, but with a little bit. We preach it every week, and it's like we don't hear it. How many times can we show you the, what, the way, show you how to live for Jesus, show you how to live for God, but when it comes down to it, you still don't do it? As dads, as moms, we know what's right. We know how we should be doing this. We know that we should be praying with our kids. We know that we should be teaching them the Bible. We know that we should be doing these things, but we, we just don't have time. Your kids see how much time you spend on everything. What you value in this world, your foundation, is your time. So what is your time spent on? What's your priorities spent on? What is it built around? What do we, what do we have this, this whole idea of like who we are? Where do you put your hope? Look there at verse 26. Go back to Matthew. Go to verse 26. It says this, it says, and everyone who hears these words of mine, again, Jesus pointing to saying, if you hear these words of mine and does not do them, will be like the foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. The Broadway the easy way of life leads to destruction. The foundation that you put your house and your life on leads to destruction. So let's talk about your storms. There are some of you in this room who are going through the worst storm of your life. Maybe somebody has passed away. Maybe somebody's sick. And you know, Jesus never says that be a believer of mine and you won't ever have any problems or struggles. He actually says when storms come, when bad times happen. So for everyone in this room, I hate to tell you, but bad times are, are going to come. Your mom's going to die. Your dad's going to die. Someone's going to get sick or hurt or injured. Does it take that to figure out what your, what your foundation is? Does it take 
when everything starts to fall apart? Is that when we find out what your foundation is? I mean, honestly, it's stubbornness, if it is anything else, that we choose to completely not hear the words of Jesus. When he says, "These are the, if you listen to the words of mine, because while we are as hearers of the words, but not doers. We're phonies. And multiple times, even in, this, in Matthew chapter 6 and 7, he actually calls us hypocrites, for we say that we are one thing, but yet we completely are another. When the storms of life come, tell me, how are you then? Where's your hope then? When everything starts to hurt and cave in on you, and the floodwaters start to rise, and the wind starts to press against you, and you're saying, you know what, I, 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 I gave my life to Jesus, hopefully that's all I had to do, and you know, I don't have to do anything else, I just had to sign a card, join a church, get baptized, volunteer at VBS, that's all I have to do. I don't really have to obey Him, do I? Yeah. He's not just Savior, but He's Lord. Lord. He deserves all of our obedience, not some of it, all of it. Now, will we do it perfectly? Absolutely not. I can never do it perfectly, but I cling to him, especially in the storms. I cling to him on the pretty days as well. Why? There's no hope anywhere else. There's no hope anywhere else. Jesus says, he says, listen to these words of mine For the person who puts their faith in the things of this world is the person who's on the sand that it's mentioned there in 26. For they are foolish builders. They put their hope in things and stuff. And and they might even say, I go to church, I, I do all these different things. God, you owe me. God owes you nothing. If you think about it, if God owes you something, he owes, like think about it, what have you done? Well, I did this, and I did this, I did this. Listen, he did it all. If he owes you anything, he deserve, you actually deserve hell now. Jesus says that if you build your life around things, stuff, money, people, or anything else, your life will be in ruins. When storms come in life, you will, it will come to you having nothing. And listen to me. What happens to these people who don't prepare for the storms in life? They end up bitter and angry about everything. You know these people. That these people are bitter and angry about the littlest things in life. That they're upset about how life has treated them. And they think that God in some way is, is, is literally pointing a finger at them going, how like they're mad at them that they're pouring out all this evil on, on God. God doesn't pour out evil. You deserve every piece of it. On your own. An atheist, I, I can't decide, because I, I love atheists, okay? I'm an apologetic guy. I love talking to atheists. My favorite thing is to talk to a person who doesn't believe that there's a God at all, okay? If you're one of those people, I'd love to talk to you. Um, but at least they're not fake. They know they have no hope other than what's in themselves. A hypocrite that's at church looks really good on the outside. House is painted perfectly well. Looks so good. But their foundation is just nothing but sand. And their family is what suffers. And so I plead to you today as a, as a dad. Your foundation is what matters more than anything in this world. It matters to your kids. It matters to, your, to the next generation. It matters to this church. I don't even care about the church. It matters to the name of Jesus. It matters. Your foundation, your life, what you obey, who you follow, where when everything comes bad, that you're the one that's standing at your dad's funeral and you're the one that people can lean on. Not because you're so great, because you serve the one who's so great. That's the man you want to be. 
You want to be the mom that when your kid is sick, that you're standing in the middle of it and saying, you know what, our trust and hope is in Christ alone. Because if it's in any of us, if it's in doctors, if it's in anything else, it only can be in Jesus. Atheists can't say that. But sometimes as Christians, we don't say it either. So many people think that they are okay with God, but don't follow anything he has instructed. That we think that we, we, we did some kind of act in the past, but yet when it comes down to it, we obey nothing to what he says now. We sin and we laugh si- with saying silly things that uh, God, we sin so vicariously, so small, thinking, oh, it's not that big a deal. We don't have to obey perfectly. I'm a sinner. I can do whatever I want. Because we know that we're going to be forgiven. That's not a believer. That's a person who treats Jesus like Santa Claus. So I ask you this. If you want to know if your house is built on rock, do you obey the Lord? Do you follow him? Because if you don't, your house is not built on a rock. What have you built your house on? I love that Austin went to, he looked at, went to the Psalms. The Psalms go crazy over calling God is my rock. God is my rock. If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalms 62. I'm going to read a lot of Psalms to you. Psalms 31. You keep turning to 62. I'm going to read Psalms 31. Psalms 31 verse 2 says, Be a rock of, my, of refuge for me, O God a strong f- fortress to save me. Verse 40, uh, Psalms 42, verse 9 says, I say to God, you are my rock. Psalms 92, 15 says, to declare the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Psalm 94, verse 22 says, but the Lord has come, my stronghold and my rock of my refuge. When everything's starting to fall down, what is your rock? Go to 62. And this is what it says at 62. 62 verse 1. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. For him comes my salvation. I wait for him. Dads, sometimes one of the hardest things for us to do is to wait on the Lord. Because what we want to do is we want to be so type A and take life by the hands and take life by the horns and just be able to say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to be the one who does it. I'm going to pull my bootstraps up. I'm going to be the one. And we're trying to be so tough. Listen to me. The true man fears the Lord and a true man is humble to the Lord. I can't do anything without him. Anything without him. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He, verse 2, he alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shake, greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him like a leaning wall or a tottering fence? They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in his falsehood. They They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse Saleh. Every bit of that is talking about the storms of life. Verse 5. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is in Him, from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken on God rest my salvation and my glory. My mighty, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Dads, can you say that today? Can you say, you're my rock, you're my salvation. I have nothing, but I have you. Nothing. Everything keeps on hitting me. All the world keeps on following me. And some of you are going through the worst storms of your life right now. 
And some of you are sitting there saying, I have no idea what to do. I have no idea what to do in this situation. Listen to me. He's got to be the rock. You have no hope other than him. It'll just be a mess. If God is not your rock, your house is built on sand. And when the storms of life come, your world will come down. So is your house built on what? What type of foundation is it built on? Do you obey Jesus' teaching? Or do you know them? Because some of us in this room, we know everything the pastor is about to say. And we even leave sermons and you go home or you go to lunch and you evaluate everything I say and go, and I agree or I disagree or whatever. Do you obey him? It doesn't matter what I say. He's asking you, if you obey me, you have your house on a rock. Do you? Or do you know all the right answers and everything, but you completely ignore him? You can ignore me, but one day, your foundation will be inspected. When I was in, in Denton, we lived in uh, the clay areas, and when we bought a house, every house that we inspected there, every house we tried to buy, when it got inspected, it had some type of crack in the foundation. Not if, it did. The, the land up there shrinks and swells, and so it moves around, and so every single, and so when you did this, you try to go and get inspected, and this inspector would tell you how bad your cracks in your house were. You could see as your, even as your joists would actually spread apart, and they would move around even in your attic. But one day, each and every one of us will be inspected just like that. And our houses either will fall into destruction and we will deserve everything we get. We will be the ones that are on the broad way, the easy way. We will be the ones that, that he will say, I never knew you. For your house might look good on the outside, but your foundation is completely sand. So here, here's your choice. And you actually get a choice. I love this. I think this is neat. You get a choice. Which road do you want to travel? The narrow road, which is hard, or the broad road, which is easy but leads to destruction? He tells you straight. What kind of foundation do you want to live your house on? Rock, where you obey the word of God and you follow his commandments, or you do not obey God and you build your house on sand. It's really as simple as that. The desire to want to build it on the rock is God speaking to you now. Because for those who God doesn't even, like, I'm telling you, if you have no desire to build it on the rock, you have no desire and you probably don't know God at all. So which foundation are you going to build it? Rock or sand? Look at verse 28. Let's look at the very last part of this. We will, we will catch this up tomorrow, next week because we will actually finish, we will actually talk about this next week. Look there at verse 28. It says, And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowd was astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. So I, I think it's great what he says here is that they're, they're saying is that at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, what they ask is this. They say, this man spoke with authority, not like the scribes, not like anyone before him. Because this is probably one of the greatest sayings in all of this entire book, is that at the end of what he taught, he never taught as, this is what it said, this is what it's, he says, this is the way it is. With such authority, if you believe the things of mine, you build your house on the, on the, on the rock. If you believe, if you don't want to listen to me, you build it on sand. I love James Montgomery voice. And I'm going to let you hear it in his words. For the most important message in the entire Sermon on the Mount, it is the person of who's actually speaking it. 
It's not any of the teachings that makes it the most important, but it's that you recognize who's the first one to, who says this. He is the Son of God. He spoke as no man has ever spoke. He lived as he, as he preached, and then he died and rose again so those who believe and trust in him might pass from life to death. And they may enter heaven and be with him forever. Do you believe that? Have you committed your life here, your future, hereafter, to Christ and Christ's care? If you make that commitment, Jesus will do for you what he has promised. He will bless you in a sense of giving you the word of the Beatitudes, and he will make you the salt to benefit to others, and he will make you the light in this dark world. He will enable you to understand and obey the Bible. He will teach you how to pray, and then you will bear you through your cares and your dangers and your frustrations of life to the eternity of the unbroken fellowship with him in heaven. Do you believe who he really is? Listen, he is speaking to you now. He is saying, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He is saying, believe in me. Let your heart say, yes, Lord, I, I'm coming to you. I want you to be my Savior and my Lord. But be warned, it is much easier to take the easy road to destruction. It is much more attractive and much more accepted that we chase after the things that are not of God. And it is easier to build our house on sand than to obey the Lord, the rock. What's your foundation? I pray it's the rock. If it's not the rock, listen to me, today, you can make today the day that I'm going to live my life this way. Dads, this is what you need to do. If, you don't, if your life is built on sand, you need to get your family together today and say, listen to me, we're huddling up and we're going to pray that we build this life, this family on the word of God. We're going to follow the commandments. We're going to follow his teachings. We're going to do these things. So I'm, I'm asking you as dads, you have to step out. You have to be the leader that you're called to be. Because when the storms come, they're going to know. It will show your foundation. Where do you put your hope? Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for the Sermon on the Mount. God, I thank you for who you are. And God, I thank you so much for all the things that you've taught us through this, that, that, that next week we, we get to see the ministry of Jesus and the tender hand of Jesus. But, but today we still get to hear one last lesson. Lord, I pray, Lord, that the men and the women of this room, Lord, I pray, Lord, that their foundation is built on a rock. And if it's not, God, I pray, Lord, that you convict our souls, convict our lives, that we will obey you, that we will follow you that we will chase you for the rest of our lives. God, that we will be prepared for when the storms come in life, that we can be able to have our hope and our foundation built on the words of you. For you are our rock. You are our refuge. You are our fortress. God, you are all that we need. If, if you're with us, who can be against us? No one. Lord, I pray, Lord, you speak to us. I thank you so much for the dads. And God, let us be dads that build our family on a rock. Let us be moms that support that, that cheer that on. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand? We'll respond with this hope that we have.
what you already want no matter what comes my way I will overcome don't know what you're doing but I know what you've done I'm fighting a battle Say 